see here, this is the second edition of the uh, Media Art and the Art Market uh, Symposium. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank like, the Interface Culture Department of the University of Linz and Arts Electronica, because thanks to them we could uh, organize this event. Um, this is um, basically a second edition, as I was saying, like of an event which already happened last year in October in the Lentos Museum, which uh, like we found um, important like to discuss which are the uh, new challenges and the new um, opportunity which the art market is having like in connection with the media art. Uh, so our first section we have two sections, and um, the first one uh, will be about uh, collecting and, and uh, preserving media art, which, as we can imagine, like it's a little bit uh, something a little bit complicated since like we are talking about technology which, which is kind of uh, delicate. And, uh, but of course, uh, we, we will see like uh, some uh, strategies that uh, galleries and uh, museums are adopting like to um, preserve um, uh, media artworks. Um, so, um, first of all, I would you like to uh, introduce you uh, Steve Fletcher, who is a, a co-founder of the Color and Fletcher uh, Gallery of London and a, lead, a leading platform of uh, contemporary art, uh, which have emphasis on the multimedia and new technologies. Uh, last month, like in August, um, he uh, set up the Artist Develop uh, Development Agency, uh, which is a non-profit organization that provides intellectual and practical uh, support for the artist. Uh, so uh, please um, come. And yeah, please welcome uh, this lecture. Thanks, Alessio. Um, I'm going to do two things this morning, um, so I'm, I've got to talk quite quickly to get through everything. The first thing is, today's actually the official launch of this new project, the Artist Development Agency, so I'd just like to spend a few minutes um, explaining uh, what the Artist Development Agency is, and then to move on from that to look at some issues related to con uh, conservation and collection, um, and really to look at it, I think, in a practical way, relative to some works that are actually um, on display at um, Ars Electronica. Um, and so as Alessio mentioned, we, uh, we effectively we, we did a strategic review of what was going on in the art market, et cetera, um, back in December last year um, at Carol Fletcher. And we decided, um, given the developments in the way the art world works, um, we were gonna split into two bits two distinct and very independent entities. One was a, a continuation of the commercial activities of Carol Fletcher, um, but in a slightly different form that responds to uh, what's going on in the, the art world. And then the second one was to set up a not-for-profit, the Artist Development Agency. And the idea behind the Artist Development Agency was um, what we noticed was when people finish their formal arts education, um, you know, you, you finish your MFA or whatever it is, you've, your master's, and you lose your studio. You lose access to low-cost production facilities. Your peer group disperses that provided you with, you know, intellectual support, emotional support, and low-cost labor. Any funding you had you, has gone. And also the tutor mentor that you might have had that was helping you develop has also gone. So all of a sudden, you find yourself adrift. And not only are you adrift in a relatively choppy sea, which arguably has some fairly aggressive sharks in it, it's almost like you're without a rudder, because what art schools do really, really well is teach you how to make work, is to understand about your pr practice. However, what they don't do very well, I would argue, is teach you how to make a living. They don't help artists think about the practical aspects of being an artist. So with that gap, um, <clears throat> when people finish, part of the problem is it's, it's not particularly well filled. So what we thought, in the sense of providing people with sustained support, there are lots of um, sort of one-off activities, 
particularly when it comes to like producing work, because that's the, that's the cool, sexy thing to do, is, you know, is to help an artist make work. Um, but there's very little about things like, where do I get some funding for that project? What residencies do I do? How should I price my work? How, what, you know, should it be additioned? Um, so what we've done with the Artist Development Agency is to set something up that provides precisely some sustained intellectual and practical support to artists during transitional stages of their development with a particular focus on this idea of uh, the first five to seven years after they finish it at art school. The, and the artists that join the agency, crucially, are on a three-year exclusive contract. So they work with the agency and only work with the agency. It's a three-year contract because that's a demonstration of mutual commitment to um, developing that artist's practice. And um, the nice thing about it being like a three-year contract is at the end of that, there's no stigma when you part company. It's not like being represented by a gallery and so suddenly the gallery drops you or you move on to a different gallery. It's a natural break. And crucially, at the end of that three-year period, part of the job of the agency is to help the artist think about what do we do next? Is it right to be represented by, a, by a, a gallery, a commercial gallery? If it is, then we will help the artist find the right commercial gallery. Um, <clears throat> but then, obviously, uh, not obviously, but at the end of the first year, um, there's actually, um, there kicks in a, a clause which means that both parties with three months notice can terminate the contract. So that, it, you know, if circumstances change, I mean, you might decide you no longer want to be an artist, that particularly if you're working in, um, you know, tech, you might think, oh, the, the, the siren call of investment banking and pots of money. Or, you, you know, you might want to travel around the world and, and, and become a Tibetan monk or whatever the hell it is. So at the end of that, it's important, I think, that people don't feel locked in such that they can't get out. But equally, it's important that there's a mutual commitment um, because this is about one of the things that's important for us. It's a partnership. Um, and we're not a gatekeeper. I think a lot of commercial galleries can act as gatekeepers between the artists and collectors, curators, the general public. Whereas this is about walking alongside the artist in partnership. Um, and in, in exchange, um, there is actually there's an annual fee, which is actually not payable in cash, it's payable in work. Because uh, clearly the one thing that artists don't have is cash. You know, they're short cash, long work. Uh, and then we get um, um, an agreed share of uh, the income from sales and artists' fees. We're starting off with uh, four artists, these four here. And I'm delighted to say that um, Jake has three works on show within uh, the main exhibition. Um, and then we also have a booth downstairs in gallery spaces, if you can actually find downstairs and gallery spaces. It took me 10 minutes this morning, and I came here last night as well. Um, and then we've also got Libby's a work by Libby Heaney uh, downstairs as well. So you can see both Jake and, and Libby's work here, and they are dealing directly with AI. Or well, AI is involved, which we'll come on to, um, in all four works. Um, we also have an advisory group, uh, which part, well, part of the reason for this is we provide intellectual support for the artists. And part of that is that we, we, we have a, an active, critical uh, series of crit sessions like you would have if you were in an art school. And so that, that is trying to recreate some sort of peer group as well as sort of mentor group, the peer group being the other artists, and then these are six people who are now on the advisory group, and hopefully over the course of the next few months, we'll, we'll get to sort of 10 to 12 people on the advisory group. And you can see we've got Jeremy Bailey is actually based in Canada, um, and Duncan Forbes is now based between LA and London. Um, and we hope to add a couple more international people to give us that sort of international spread as well as um, spread within in, in the UK. So that's where they're at. So that was a brief introduction to the Artist Development Agency, and I'm happy to talk about that at any point um, afterwards. 
So coming on to conservation and collecting, I thought today, the thing is, I, um, there's a lot of stuff on conservation and collecting. You know, the challenges of reproducibility, originality, authorship, authenticity, obsolescence, etc. Um, so I've given you a few references which I think cover that. And I'm sure the you know, other speakers will also be covering some of those technical issues. Um, and it's a mixture there you can see between an artist in Raphael Lozana Hemmer, a, you know, a very serious collector who's thought very deeply about these issues in Alain Seve, um, and then more of a, you know, two more academic uh, people. And I think Erica's new book is, is, is very good from a, a film and video uh, point of view. But I'm going to talk about something very different today, but, and that's what I think is really important when it comes to um, what we want like to media art, new media art, electronic art, what the heck. And it's in praise of wall text and titles. Because I think that the wall text and titles are an integral part of the work. And it's really important, I think, that we are very clear in our descriptions of the work. Um, because a lot of claims are made that this is AI, for example, and lots of it isn't AI. And therefore, when a collector enters into an active conversation about the work, they immediately get distanced by the fact that we haven't done a good job describing it. And also, when it just comes to experiencing the work, often it needs, people need some help not to tell them what the work's about, but to stimulate them to think and maybe provide some information because we're dealing with some very arcane, esoteric um, uh, technology that is difficult to, to understand. And I think that quote from Socrates from however many thousand years ago is, you know, is important that there is an element where we need to provide a way into the work. And I think it's important to split that into two bits. There's the ekphrasis to take us back to the fine art term that came from the Greek and was talked about in classical times, which is just that some sort of description of the work, which is a bit like watering a plant. I mean, you just help the work grow in the mind of the person experiencing it. But I think alongside the classical sort of ekphrasis that one would get taught in, in, in doing fine art degrees or whatever. I think um, there's a technical description which takes us into often how the work has been produced, precisely what the materials are. Now you don't talk about the materials so much with a painting because we're familiar and we're not that interested in, they might have been if you go back and you look at the contracts in sort of the 14th and 15th century, the artist contracts that they had, you know, the, the patrons would stipulate just how much lapis lazuli or whatever was in the painting or how much gold was in the painting because that was important from a prestige point of view. But obviously we don't do that these days. But I think when we're looking at the, some of the fabulous work in, the, in, in Ars Electronica, there's A, an interested audience that wants to know, well, is that really an adversarial um, generative neural network or not? Is it live? Is it a film? So I think it's, that technical description becomes important, but also it becomes important because often there is a resonance between the, the, the materials that are being used the conceptual and the conceptual content of the work. And I like to say just that you know, the ekphrasis is not telling you what the work's about. It's actually an open stimulus. You know, it's a point of departure, a point of entry in, you know, into the work. And I think and it should also be clear and concise and not full of art jargon. And the technical description then is not the technical manual. I think one of the things that's really important, and Raphael Lozana Hemmer, for example,'s website is a really good source for this, is you know, if you're going to do a technical work, a work that's then you need to have a manual that enables the collector to look after the work. And, you know, and also, I would argue, for a lot of artists, when you do your sales contract, 
you need to think about the maintenance contract that's embedded in the sales contract. You know, how long are you going to make sure those webcams are live? How long are you going to make sure that the software is updated? So, but that's a different thing from the technical description of the work and is incredibly important. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, I recommend highly going to Raphael, Raphael Azana Hemmer's website where you'll find that he has technical manuals, the code is open source, and it's a very good um, uh, idea of good practice if you're uh, a new media, well, somebody dealing with th th this sort of work. <clears throat> and just an anecdote about one of the reasons I have a bee in my bonnet about this is at Carol Fletcher, we did a show recently um, that had Constant Dullar's work in it, this one here. And I actually wasn't involved in the, the show, so I came along as, you know, to do my sort of crit, if you like, with the, the person who put the show together. And you walk into the gallery and you see, the, you saw these six portraits. And it was described as the works entitled sort of people implicated in undermining the Arab Spring. And this is six portraits of people who've effectively exported to repressive regimes the means of repression. So surveillance technologies, etc. And they're blurred, and then there's a, the, the glass in front is sort of etched glass that further blurs it, so you've got this double distancing. And that's all fine, and it, it looks like an interesting enough work, and it sets you thinking. But knowing constant, I thought that's, there's got to be more to it, and there is. But when I asked the, the person who put the show together, they said, oh, well, yeah, he did say something, but I didn't quite understand what he meant. So I sort of left it out. And so I thought, well, I'll go and talk to Constant. And what's the work itself, when you buy the work, you get, you don't just get what you see there, you get a digital file. The digital file contains the JPEG of the image so that you can print it, you know, and instructions about how it should be printed. But crucially, encoded in the soft in the JPEG is the narrative about who the person is and tells you the name of the person and what they've done. And you can only read that if you run the JPEG through another file, not like a text editor, but you know, you can run a JPEG through a text editor and look at the, the, the glitchy stuff that it pulls up. And so the work itself is actually the digital file and the image. But the curator had ignored the digital file because they didn't understand. And my argument is the reason that wall text and titles are important is you only get that if somebody gives you that way in. And then you see this is a wonderful work because technically it's enhancing the concept behind the work because what Constance also trying to suggest is there's a way to actually get around this repression. There is this technology that can be used also for liberation. And you wouldn't get that from the way it was originally curated. And I'm sorry to say that that happens an incredible amount. So, this is where I'm supposed to be technical and it's gonna go horribly wrong. We're gonna look very, very, very quickly at um, some of the works that are on show. 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 100, 100, this is million, 100, 100, 100, 100, 10, million, fives, 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 four, fives, three, fives, fives, five, And this will get described as having AI in it. One, six, six, seven, 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 eight, eight, nine, nine, five thousand. Um, and if you look at, oops, not that one. traditional wall text, it would just tell you that. This is the wall text you'll see downstairs, slightly edited, because there's a hell of a lot of interviews, so. And, and I have heard it, so people say, oh, this, this is sort of an AI work. Well, it's not really, because the only way Jake used AI was because he sourced these 50 hours of videos, and rather than listen to them, and figure out exactly where every time there was a number and writing the time down, what Jake did 
was he just ran it through, a, through something that's been trained, so it's an AI that's been trained to recognize, to transcribe from speech to text. The, if you're familiar with it, the IBM Watson AI. So it's, you know, it's no different from, um, you know, the way you, you know, you might use, um, uh, you know, a different type of wash or whatever when you're painting. It's not, the AI bit is irrelevant to the, to, to the work. It's just what Jake happened to use to, con to construct what's in effect just a film. So now we're going to, then in contrast, there's Libby's work, um, Lady Chatterley's um, Tinderbot, um, which is downstairs. Um, and this is based on um, the Tinder app, the Tinder dating app. And it's an interactive work. So when you go downstairs, you can just swipe, it's a touch screen, you swipe right, you swipe left, and you get the com Tinder conversations. And this is somebody uh, using the screen. So you get the Tinder conversations. Now this is an AI work, but what you see downstairs is, a is, is effectively just a digital file. It's not live because Libby used, the, used an AI to create uh, the work. So normally you just see in the a straightforward text which would make no mention of the AI. You'd be getting it from the title a little bit from the Tinderbot. This is the normal, what we call, what, what I would think of as the, the ekphrasis, um, where Libby effectively trained the AI, which is the more technical description which comes next. So Libby um, took this existing AI, this Bernie dot AI, trained it using conversations, direct conversations from Lady Chatterley's lover, and then set this loose, this Tinder bot loose into the world of Tinder with these um, characteristics. So all the conversations it had with the other users were actually text from Lady Chatterley. And then Libby harvested all that and then turned it into a static work which has two expressions. One is what you, well, the, you see them both downstairs, in fact. One, one expression is the, effectively, the digital file which has over 800 anonymized conversations which is then presented, you know, via a computer and a, a, onto a touch screen and um, you know, you interact with the you interact with the touch screen, and that's a closed, si stable system that's just a digital file. And then there's a, an analog version, if you like, which is a book where Libby has sifted through them, sort of found, if you like, archetypes within that, and, and done it as the 19 chapters of, of of Lady Chatterley. But crucially, I think there. You know, the the questions it's asking or prompting about do you know who you're interacting with at the other end of a, a dating app or even at the other end of, of Twitter or whatever, um, are enhanced by the, fact, you know, by the fact that an AI has been used. But the work itself, what you see downstairs, you know, isn't um, an AI. And then the final work um, that I'd like to talk about is Jake's work, which hopefully, and this is um, in somewhere else in Post City. And what you're seeing here is um, a single screen rendering of an installation where you have two screens facing each other and the two screens are in conversation. So you've actually got two AIs in conversation with each other. The one on the the, the right is conversing in text, and the one on the left is conversing in images. So what happens is, the one on the right says bird flying in the air, or in this note, so the sky is blue and clear, is what that thinks that is. Now it's the left-hand side's reacting and saying, how do I represent sky is blue and clear? And you sort of, you've got this representation 
of the almost like the AI thinking. Is this, is this a sky? And getting until it gets it. And now the right-hand side reacts to that. So you've got these two AIs in conversation. Now, if I get back to present, present rather. You know, again, if you just had the traditional wall text, that's all you'd get. Now, this is more like the ekphrasis. Now, what we're trying to do here is just open it out a little bit because can an AI have a conversation? Does an AI think? What does it mean for us to use AIs? You know, what, we use this, if you like, it's, not the, it's like the pathetic fallacies, the way in which, uh, what's this language that we use? Um, and with that, but we don't want to, what we try not to do is to say that explicitly, is just to get, is to lead, is to help people to, to think about what they're, they're looking at. But crucially, there's then, um, and this slightly tails off, because unfortunately Jake's website cuts off at the bottom. Um, but this is genuinely AI, in the sense of it's two AIs talking to each other, but for the purposes of today, I think what's interesting is actually what you see in the, the gallery spaces here isn't two AIs in conversation. What you see is a .mov file, so you see effectively a video of the live version. And the reason we're not showing the live version is it's still not stable enough to, to put it out into the big wide world, as it were. There's still a few glitchy bits to it. So what we're doing is we're creating a film, which is the documentation of the work. And then ultimately, there will be a live version. And what we then need to figure out, the challenge now for, for Jake, um, and hopefully I can help him a little bit, is how do we create that as something that's stable and conservable and preservable? What does that mean in terms of you know, the obsolescence of the software, the obsolescence of the hardware? And those are the challenges, I think, that, that, we, that we face. Because it's not just about collecting in terms of a financial transaction. I would argue, um, and Erica picks up this very nicely in her book, um, as does Alain in his piece, actually, I would argue that now it, collecting isn't just about ownership. Collecting is about going back to patronage, and it's about accepting the responsibility to preserve the work through time. And so, you know, with this, the question is, how do we do that with a work that I think is, you know, one of the most interesting works um, that's been made to, 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 to get us to think about the nature of, of, of AI and consciousness, etc. But it's not yet ready. But if we released it into the world and we said it was ready and it falls over, what, all that happens is the people that have purchased it will never come back. And it's real, you know, I think that's, and, all, and, and crucially, people don't necessarily pick up on the art historical importance of these works and the potential of the works to really, you know, help people gain a grasp of these issues that are effect, fundamentally affecting the way we live our lives. And that's why I think it's really important that we have a responsibility to clearly explain through wall text, through, you know, through, through titles, through the way we write about it, that we clearly explain exactly what the work is and we rise to those challenges of you know, creating objects which have integrity and are sustainable through time and are not just one-offs that you know, fizzle away. So I'll leave. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much. Um, maybe we, uh, we have time for a very, very short question if somebody as it, uh, at the moment, oh, yeah, uh, where is the mic? <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for this really nice insight. Um, you mentioned that you see the art schools have more responsibility also, not just to educate people, make great artworks, but also to educate them how to live from their artworks. Do you have, like, any proposals? Because I think here would be a very good 
forum to propose this. As you know, we are running together with Alessio a proposal for a peak application mm -hmm. where we want to make new formats for artists, media artists, uh, how to make a living from media art. Do you have any proposals? Or maybe we can dis discuss also later. Well, I think it's, it's recognizing that I think the discourse within art schools is still one of that's based well that's based on the sort of the romantic notion of the artist as this lone genius touched by the gods i'm afraid i just think that art's a job and in the sense that um art should be part of everybody's life both as a producer and a consumer and it's not somehow cut off from life it's not art and life it's art is part of life and that some people are able to make a living from that because they happen to be supremely talented in the same way that somebody supremely talented as a plumber or whatever else. Um, and I think it's just facing, so the question then is just recognizing that it's, that, that we, need, we need to think about if people are going to go into it, how do they make a living? And I think it's just having that attitude in that, okay, we're, we're not just teaching people how to make work, we're te potentially we're teaching some people who are gonna make a living from this. And, but some work isn't that commercial. So the question then is, how do you integrate your practice with the rest of your life? Because quite frankly, you know, 90% um, of filmmakers are never gonna make any money from their work. And if you take like Jeremy Bailey as an example, Jeremy is a, t is a very successful sort of tech person and he makes his money by coding and and, and, and and he said to me he's in no year has he made more than twenty thousand dollars in income from his art well clearly and he's a reasonably successful famous new media artist um, but then it's about so for Jeremy he's got another skill set so it's, it's it's just being able to have that conversation and, and recognizing that yeah so I need just how having courses, you know, bringing people, you know, that, so I think it's, it's um, in the same way you would do if you were at a business school or whatever, you'd, um, but I think it's just a change of mindset slightly that's, that seems to me to be needed. Thank um, thanks so much. Um, I'm now introduce you the next uh, speaker, like Minoru Atanaka, who is a chef uh, curator at Entity Intel Communication Center. He has curated exhibition uh, there, like um, sound art, sound and media, sounding space, uh, next new generation of media artists, and silent dialogue, exploration, impossible uh, spaces, vibration and entities, internet art future, reality in post-internet era, art plus com, rhythmatics, research, poetics, um, structure um, of light and motion. Uh, please welcome uh, Atawa Tanaka, Mi uh, sorry, <laughs> Minoru. Ah, nice to meet you. So thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this kind of uh, uh, conference. So I come from uh, ICC, Entity Intercommunication Center, uh, Tokyo. So uh, and, uh, this year, 2017, uh, is a 20-year uh, anniversary year of ICC. So um, today, uh, I would like to uh, present uh, our uh, collection and uh, our digital archive named Hype. So uh, the tema is archiving work and exhibition in media art uh, in case of ICC. So um, this uh, um, conference, uh, the theme of collect, collecting. Uh, so um, in, in Japan, so not so much museum as a media art collection. So, uh, but uh, uh, ICC, in the beginning, we have uh, uh, 10 commissioned work uh, as a ICC collection. 
So um, in in the opening time, nine, uh, 1997. So um, and later uh, in 1998, uh, one piece uh, at and later 1999, uh, three pieces also uh, added. That's better. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, uh. So uh, in total, uh, ICC has a collection uh, of 14 pieces of media works. So, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, no new works have been collected since 1999. So uh, it's a reality. <laughs> So uh, some, uh, I, I would like to introduce a uh, 14 uh, collection of uh, ICC. So uh, this is a seven memories of media technology uh, by Iwai Toshio, uh, Galapagos, uh, Carl Sims, uh, World Membrane and uh, Dismembered Body, uh, Mi uh, Seiko Mikami. So and uh, the, today's host, uh, Krista Somura and Roland Minion's uh, life spaces. So and uh, Ulrich Gabriel, terrain number two. Uh, and uh, installation over by dump type. So and uh, Jeffrey Shaw and the members uh, config, 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 yeah? <laughs> configuring the cave. So, and uh, Japanese artist um, Masayuki Toata and uh, Yasuyuki Matsumoto translation. So, uh, Indonesian artist Heridono no uh, Gamran of Nomunication. And uh, Jagra by Gregory Basamian. So, and uh, Udi Basulka, uh, The Maiden. So, it's a, a second uh, collection uh, after the opening. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in 1998, uh, as a new collection, uh, three pieces of a new collection, uh, Luc Kulshen, uh, Landscape One, and uh, Shuri Chen, Buy One, Get One, uh, Kitsugu Mayabayashi, uh, Audible Distance. So, in, it's a total 14 uh, media works. So, uh, permanent exhibition of ICC collection ended in 2000. But uh, uh, so uh, at the beginning, we have a permanent collection, permanent exhibition. But uh, uh, that uh, permanent exhibition uh, finished uh, in 2000. So, um, and Jaguar has been exhibited um, 1999, uh, 1997 uh, to the present. Um, and uh, later, after the uh, permanent exhibition, some uh, chance uh, has uh, some some works has chance to re exhibit uh, in 2003 and 2005. So uh, currently, the only work that can be exhibited is uh, Jaguar. Only one work uh, in the 14 uh, collection. Only one uh, one uh, work remained. So, um, um, problem, problems and the solution in um, art form difficult to preserve, uh, so, such as media art. Uh, it's a four, uh, three, three cases uh, to uh, preserve. So, temporary exhibition format, uh, such as installation, uh, it's, a, um, it's difficult, to, uh, collect, uh, difficult to collect. So, uh, but uh, uh, some, uh, some of them, some, some works, um, the chance of reproduction. So, uh, some uh, Jap Japanese, uh, in the museum, so some installation works has collected. But uh, um, um, this kind of work, uh, so reproduction, uh, so each, uh, at the time of each exhibition. So, uh, and the performing arts and the project-based work. So it's uh, um, only uh, collected as a document and uh, uh, sometimes instruction. So and, uh, in, in this uh, case three, um, problem that equipment used in technology art and media art will become obsolete. 
So uh, sometimes uh, the artist uh, replaced hardware uh, and rewriting software, uh, conversion, uh, the uh, program data. So, um, <coughs> uh, so I would like to uh, talk about uh, documentation of media artworks, uh, and publication and uh, effectiveness. So it is difficult to preserve artworks using media and technology such as computers uh, represented uh, by present media and me present media and art. So also interactivity in media art is difficult to reproduce uh, unless the work can be operated. In the very beginning, concept of ICC, uh, there was an idea of an in invisible museum. So it, uh, uh, it was uh, realized uh, using uh, in, uh, network technology. So uh, in, in the very beginning, ICC's uh, project uh, is uh, named um, Invisible Museum Inside of Telephone Network. So it's a concept of uh, this kind of invisible museum. So using uh, telephone, so audience uh, can listen um, the artist's uh, voice and music and uh, uh, receive uh, uh, drawing by uh, fax. <coughs> so um, it, <coughs> it was uh, not by facility as a place, uh, our work as a things, but uh, storing programs and software as data. So it's uh, uh, the concept of ICC in the very beginning. But uh, uh, we had a, a place uh, as a center uh, in 1997. <coughs> so and uh, <coughs> if the work itself does not exist, uh, even more documentation becomes a very valuable material for preservation. Um, and uh, by documenting the state of being worked, documents will supply the opportunity to be referred to later researcher or curator as a substitute for the actual work. So document of media artworks may be subject for future research materials. That is an alternative way to uh, preservation of media artworks. We need to consider the possibility of con conceiving an archive for the possibility of reproducing media artworks. So, <clears throat> verification of the uh, reproductivity of the work uh, through reproduction of the exhibition. Uh, and the verification of repro re reproducibility from photograph and the artist testimonies. So in the case of um, not uh, in media artworks, so this is a, a very famous uh, contemporary artworks. So one is a, a Matthew Duchamp's uh, fountain. So this is a only a photograph. So some, some uh, uh, replica exists uh, in the museum, but uh, um, we all know uh, very famous this photograph. Uh, as a found, uh, we all know uh, the fountain as a, this famous photograph. But sometimes uh, we can see uh, the replica of the fountain. So it's a totally uh, different image uh, of the work. So uh, this means uh, photographs of artworks are usually regarded as a secondary material as documents. However, if the work itself does not exist, it becomes a very valuable material. So um, sometimes uh, this kind of uh, document, photograph documentation of the artwork is um, more, effective, as, uh, more effective, effective than uh, real work. So um, the photograph of light site is a Japanese uh, famous movement after the <coughs> um, 
1960s, uh, the movement Monoha. Um, so it's uh, it's outside uh, sculpture. So this is um, more like uh, three meters uh, totem. So, but uh, uh, real one, so reproduced uh, real one is uh, not so much uh, uh, feel big scales. But uh, in this photo, uh, we uh, feel the scale, big scale of uh, artwork. But the uh, real one is um, just like uh, three meters high. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we can feel more dynamics of uh, work from photography. So <clears throat> documenting the detail of the actual exhibition of the work leads to the possibility uh, the work can be distorted in some way by uh, recreating the work in the future. So um, <clears throat> this, uh, this kind of photograph uh, remained uh, photograph. So um, some uh, people can uh, the kind of hint of reproduction. So, um, <clears throat> so I ICC have a uh, um, digital archive. So um, this uh, contains this uh, archive contains. Um, most, most of uh, video documentation of uh, event and uh, some artist interview and uh, artist talk and symposium and the perform performance um, <clears throat> since 1997. So uh, this archive, now, still now, uh, this, kind, this archive uh, worked as a um, Document, doc, documentation of the past event. But uh, um, we have uh, the, these kind of uh, archives uh, um, so contains uh, past 20 years. So uh, it's, it can be uh, accessed uh, via internet and uh, in the, our center. So uh, <clears throat> audience can see, audience can view more uh, archives within the uh, uh, center. So because of the uh, copyright, so uh, so less contents can be seen uh, by the internet. So, but uh, <clears throat> uh, in in Japan, uh, this kind of uh, uh, archive, uh, not, not so much museum. Uh, don't have uh, this kind of archive. So, um, uh, so uh, this uh, archive na named Hype. So I, I explained uh, uh, <coughs> this archive. So NTT Intercommunication Center currently uh, video archive, uh, currently video archive Hype, uh, video documentation such as ICC activity reports events, workshop, interviews um, with artists and uh, experts are recorded as digital archives. Uh, so an audience can uh, view it in the ICC and the website. So this is um, uh, URLs. Yeah. So um, this contains uh, ICC's activities documentation since 1997. So uh, audience can uh, reach easily A museum that anticipates the future of creativity. The NTT Intercommunication Center.
In our first year after our opening in April 1997, the Intercommunication Center sponsored a wide-ranging program of exhibitions, opening events, performances, workshops, and symposia, exploring the future of communication and technology. of past year. ICC's opening was kicked off with a symposium entitled Towards the Museum of the Future. Discussions and proposals focused on the roles to be played by new art museums. The Audio Gruppe visited Japan for the first time for ICC's opening. They put on a variety of performances at Tokyo Opera City and other locations in the Tokyo area. The opening of ICC was also marked by a network event called Disclavier. In this collaboration, participants manipulated alter egos called avatars in a virtual space. So, uh, not, not only exhibition, um, but also uh, uh, films and accidents. Performance event. One event and, uh, related to the satellite TV workshop was called Extended Thrill. This was a collaboration between the sound performance group Sensor Van and the sound installation group Granular Synthesis. Remote Piano Installation. This experimental project was headed by musician Ryuichi Sakamoto, media artist Toshio Iwai, and network artist Koichiro Eto. So uh, you can see uh, the uh, document of activity of ICC uh, since uh, 1997, so uh, 20, uh, for 20 years. And uh, also um, this is a, a original content of ICC. Uh, the interview series. Um, this is an uh, archive of the uh, artists and uh, scientists, uh, critics. So, uh, so this also uh, can see uh, by internet. So, and also uh, you can uh, download and uh, you can, uh, this, con this content can be used under the uh, license of uh, Creative Commons. Sort of um, lost interest in that and then Imagine myself um, so a years as ago. an art so historian many, uh, and uh, <laughs> did a, another year of um, academic studies at, uh, at the university in Melbourne. So, um, this uh, archive is only a, a document uh, of ICC, but uh, in, in the future, so if uh, artists can use for uh, reproduction of uh, their works, so it will be uh, uh, this kind of archive. So also uh, can be used as a uh, for a reproduction. So. 
So, um, <clears throat> so this this kind of ar archive so uh, can be used. Uh, so how how to use? Uh, um, sorry. So this recently, uh, Japanese uh, cultural agency start uh, to support uh, so reproduction uh, of uh, media artwork. So. Um, <clears throat> Last year, um, the uh, title uh, 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 Teiji Furuhashi's uh, Lovers uh, all reproduced uh, in a uh, uh, university. So, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, Still now, uh, we only have uh, these kind of documents. But uh, uh, in the future, uh, so we, we would like to have more uh, documents for the reproduction of the media. Art. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. OK. Um, I will introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Anita Becker. Um, she is uh, co-founder of Anita Becker Gallery, and um, she has been like a board member of the Institute for New Media in Frankfurt, and uh, she has been part of the jury and organization of the Video Art Fair Loop uh, in Barcelona. Um, she has also been part of a satellite exhibition space, uh, a space for young talent, uh, for yeah, young talent in the city hall of Frankfurt. And she has been curator of uh, words on video in Palazzo Strozzi in Florence. In uh, 2011, uh, she uh, established an internet uh, platform, Blink Video, uh, together with uh, Julia Sokenland. Um, and she's also curator at uh, B3 uh, Biennale for Moving Image in Frankfurt. Please uh, welcome Anita Beckers. So thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, okay, I have a lot to think after we have this speak, speech from the two person in front of me. And I don't know where I have to start because I am a very practical person. I was thinking in which point I should start to, to explain my work. I was studying in 1990 as a publisher, and in 1994, I think I have made my first exhibition with media art. It was called Media Art. In this time, it was an artist from Italy, Alba Dobano. She was the assistant from Peter Weibel in the Institute for New Media in Frankfurt. Nobody, as we have shown this in the gallery, nobody could understand what we are doing there or what the artist is doing. And then I have continued and continued, and in 1998, we moved from Darmstadt, our gallery, to Frankfurt, and we had an additional video space, and from this time on, we have made all the time an exhibition with, with painting, sculpture, whatever, and also a show with moving image, all types of moving image from this time. Then I have learned, and also the, the visitors from the gallery have learned a lot about this medium. But in between, so many things are happening because technology is developing all the time. And what Mr. Fletcher and also my colleague from Japan has told us, it's really the summary of this shows us that we have to have to that we have to talk on an international level and try to make standards how to handle we, uh, works what are technology based or the, what we call moving image all the the determination of all these artworks are not um, i think are not using, uh, we can't use anymore. We have also to find new words 
for these art pieces. And coming back to this was, um, Mr. Fletcher has told about his new organization. It makes me thinking, how should it work? Because I work also sometimes in workshops with universities, and the question of the young artist, how to make my, how, how from what can I make my living in the future? It's always a substantial question. And in, the, in this way, I'm a very romantic person. I tell them all the time, you have to think about your art, what you like to do, how you like to visualize your idea. And if you take technology um, tools for it, you have also to find a way that the art piece has to touch people's heart. And I think it's not a problem to sell moving image or to sell computer-based artworks if it has some content in it was people, uh, that people are touched from it. But there is a big gap in between what artists are producing and what is, what is uh, bought on the art market. Uh, there, there are so many, many questions. What I got now after I have listened these two speeches, and I have to make it now a little bit uh, concentrated. I was also asked uh, to speak a little bit about conservation. And conservation, we talked in the morning about it, it's always a still going on issue and question. It's depending on the development of technology. And I think we have really, this is a good place, Ars Electronica is one of the only place what I know in Europe who has such a, a type of festival or the worldwide. And I think we have to, or the people who are uh, responsible, they have to start here, or they have start um, to make discussions if we can find in the national standards, standards that everybody is using, dealing with this subject of technology-based artworks. And we have this biennial in Frankfurt, and the next edition is in, in November this year. And I think we have also to talk about this, and we have invite people who are here, who have more knowledge as I and all the people what we have invited has. And if you look in the internet, you can find so many information. I think the ZKM is one of the leading institutions worldwide who has worked about conservation. And we can talk and we can talk, but I think we have to, make, we have to write some paragraphs down. And then we have to discuss the paragraphs worldwide and we have to find universities or the institution who are con continuously present and searching on whatever that they take care about the development. We, I am a gallerist and I cannot finance and I cannot organize all these things. We have to work for the artist, make the artist living, how we call it. And then, therefore, we need this um, support from institution or the, from universities. What I was also thinking in the last days was, how can we, how can we conserve all the artworks what we have sold in the time where I'm selling video work? As I was starting in 1993, 94, we were selling VHS uh, cassettes. Some cassettes we have later, the artists have translated it on a DVD, but it was not uh, recorded in HD. Today, who? Today we have HD. The question is also to discuss with artists, with institutions, with curators, whatever. Is it necessary that an artist who has worked in, in uh, video art and it's not, the files are not digital, should we con uh, conserve this in this way or should the artist consider to 
transform it in a digital file, if this is, is this possible, but what is the original work? Is this still the original work? There are so, so many uh, questions what we have to talk about, and I think uh, a forum like here is, we, we can't talk about all this question. We have really to make a big list with also substantial question and have to discuss this. And the problem is to sell art, technology-based art or the video art that was also in the speech from Mr. Fletcher in the morning, people are really afraid. We have so many people who are really good art collectors and they are interested to buy video works or the other works and then they ask, can I be sure that nobody makes a copy from this? You can look in the internet, you have YouTube videos or whatever. They are not really informed or that they don't understand that does not is the same if you look something in YouTube, in the internet, or that you have a limited original piece. But all these questions are now not relevant anymore if people like Alliance Service and so many other people are discussing now if we have to change um, to handle and to, to deal with this moving image. What, do, what are we doing in the future? Buy we only rights and se or the sell we rights to the collectors and how, how is this handled and how many companies are providing these uh, files for us. But I miss a little bit the discussion how the artists are feeling in this part. We, the artists need money to produce works and it's always too less discussed how can we find new ways for production support. Of course, there are many, I come from Germany, there are many foundations where artists can apply for production support, but mostly it's our film production and for video art we don't have so much support. This is also the reason why if you go today to um, Video Nale or the, some other festivals, you have not a video in a, t in a running time from 10 until 30 minutes. Mostly you have films with 90 minutes, with 60 minutes. I think this is, depends to the rules for production support. And you see, there are so many questions. We, it, it would, I would like to make a Q and A speech. You should ask me, or the, and you should ask me question how we can act, or what would be better. I think if I have only this monologue, and you are not uh, more intelligent on the end. But I'm really, really worried that we things are not under control anymore, the, the internet. The internet gives so many options today. And this is what I like to, uh, yeah, please. The artists, you know, how do they react? Do, do, do they, they um, take use of the internet? Because I think that the internet is a platform like YouTube to promote their artwork, or are they more restricted and uh, rely on traditional forms of gallery Yeah, I think there are three or the four types of, of young artists or the students. One type is, is, the, is the, the other artists who are looking only how fast can I be famous. And they are, they are not so interested about content. It's my feeling, it's my personal feeling. I can be totally wrong. They are only interested how can I get famous very fast. The next, um, the next part, it's really depending on his idea to realize works and are always looking for jobs to make it possible that they can produce the work. We had in the last biennial, we had in Frankfurt an, a Hollywood producer and he was talking about production support. 
And he had a very good answer to some young artists. They asked him, how can I get support from a company like you? And he says, not at the moment. Your family is your production company. And after you have made good works, then you can come to us. And this is, I think this is a problem, but we can't, but we can't uh, solve at the moment because so many artists are in the world and we have only limited supporting possibilities. And we have a lot of art schools in Germany, and I think you have this in Austria too. They are really supportive for her artists as long as they are on the university and study. And they are in a competition all the time. If they make good works, they get support. But if they have works, what you can see many times in, in different variation, it's hard. It's hard. Some more questions? Maybe, yes. maybe also, Pardon? Um, um, maybe to your, to your uh, question also, um, I'm, I'm Julia Zirkeland and running with Anita Becker's uh, Blink video platform. And um, the showing works on YouTube is always uh, also a problem of rights and uh, that, that was the reason why we founded, for instance, Blink Video, because there the films are shown passport protected and uh, a lot of the artists that is on my experience, they don't want to show things on, on YouTube or only very few parts or maybe an excerpt or something small. But, um, of course, it is um, interesting to have a platform which is somehow curated and where you have somehow also a, a level of, um, of um, yeah, quality so that curators or, or people who look at it also don't have to search inside of thousands and thousands of videos because also on YouTube, if you don't know the name, you don't find anything by chance. So uh, that was the background where, why we founded this, this uh, platform, Blink Video, uh, to, to give uh, the possibility to, to watch films on the web, but protected. Okay, make me, we make a summary for, for conservation, because this was one part what I was asked for. My wish is that we have, that we use all platforms in the future, what we can get and work together with different universities and make from time to time a new state in the art of conversation, write it down and I, we have to find an international organization. We have a European gallery association and I am a part of, uh, or the, I am a member of the German Gallery Association. I was trying in 1998 or the, until 2005 to convince the, the Gallery Association to help us or to help all the galleries how to handle selling video art. What are the parameters? I worked out a questionnaire in 2005. Nobody, it was, it was, um, in some newspapers discussed and some lawyers have discussed about it, but nothing was happening. We have always to be active by ourselves, the members who are in the game around. And therefore, this is my appeal. Please let us build platforms and then we, we write down all the needed parameter and develop it and give it to the artists, give it to the collectors, and and wherever is the a player in this game. And as we were starting um, showing video art, and it was a time where it was very interesting to show it because it was starting also the international exhibitions, was 20, then later 50% of all the artworks works was moving image. And it brings to the gallery a lot of work. We had all over in the world, we had to send DVDs 
for research because curators was doing shows or the collectors was asking and there were and the, the internet was developing and therefore I was thinking we, sh we, we should find a way to do this via internet and then I met Julia Circuland I we know each other very a very long time and then I was talking about this issue to her and she says I am developing a platform and therefore we came together and she is the technical and also the intellectual part of this platform Blink Video. She knows much more as I know. And um, it was a good, a good way to do it because this is a very good um, research tool and she can uh, talk a little bit and can explain a little bit about it. And after I saw now everything what we had in the talk before, I think the Blink video is still relevant. This platform should also be developed because this is a place where, in the, where you can find international event to the, uh, for the moving image, festivals, whatever, selections from the festivals, prize winners. And also for this platform, we need a community to work together, how make this living, and it's easier to run a platform what is established in a, in a way, and then you fill in with all the information what you have to fill in in the future or in the present, what, what we have to add, and how the platform is, is running. Julia, will you please present it a little bit? Hello, again, and um, maybe just uh, to, to start it from the beginning once more. Um, can I, yeah. So always in the background there, there is a, a special film, always changing, and uh, then you have different different um, sections on the on the platform where we you can select it either either via via artists for instance there you can search for artists you can search for representing galleries and um, our main projects are uh, what we call featured projects there we have we work together with curators or we work together with different um, festivals and shows and um, for instance here we, we presented a video Nale of this year and you can then here watch watch all all the films normally in full length it could be sometimes that that artists don't want pr to present it in a in a full length because there are some festival reasons because it has to go through festivals again, so we then show an excerpt, but normally, because it's password protected, we can show here also in full length. So it's a, a real research platform where you can, where you can search for team themes. You can, we also have, have a search where you, it is searched through all the texts, so you can also put a, some some keywords, keywords and, and search for this. And um, we, are, we are just uh, launching it also new. It will be in the end of October. We will have a new website. In the moment, it's when we began. Um, still, Flash was a very, good, a very good tool, and it was used also by, by all the television companies. But now it is, it is gone, and we programmed everything new. It is also ready but um, in a test phase, and we also want to add quite a lot of new features. Um, you will hear in the afternoon people from NIO talking, and they have uh, with Alain Cervez also mm. together uh, done um, a project where, where they, um, in a very new,
<laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, so we, we will add quite a lot of new tools where you as also can very easily then Borrow, borrow videos, send it to, to the museums, have a very easy tool to, to, uh, to present it, um, buy things. So we will work together also with NEO and uh, we, will, um, we will add this to Blink Video and uh, it will be a very, a very complex tool after that where you can, where it really ends that you have to send out uh, DVDs and uh, things to museums because you can just do it from the platform itself. But for these technical things you will hear near you in the afternoon so I don't have to explain yeah. this. And we are mainly, we are mainly a search tool so uh, we, we do more the content than all this technical background. And I can come to the conclusion, I think, oh, sorry. We have really a vision, and this is also a question on the audience. I think the competition worldwide uh, exists. There are other platforms in the internet who are doing nearly the same. The question is for me all the time, how can we make things easier? This is a non-commercial platform. We have financed it until now. But we are thinking, we are looking for partner or are we looking for a university or an institution who could all, who could go in company with us. This is the question for the future, what we have to answer. Do you have any questions? No, everybody is satisfied. Uh, Anita, tomorrow there will be another session where we will also have a moderated discussion with different galleries. So I think we could pick up on many of the things to, that you said now. So for those of you who are here today, please come back tomorrow for the mm -hmm. other session. And uh, I think there's also a chance to discuss uh, more in detail about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, this, I do this discussion now more as 20 years, 25 years, but always on the state of the art from this time. Mm -hmm. And you see, you have to continue this all the time. And therefore, it's wonderful if we could come to a point that we work really closer together and not in each country all over the world somebody is doing his own stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying and I think that's very important is that we need a more orchestrated effort of bringing this issue and I think as Electronica is one very good platform yeah, for this kind yeah, of I think so. uh, I need think and this kind of discussion. Because uh, Blink, um, no, the Biennial in Frankfurt it can help, but it's not so focused on this type of art. It's focused on film, video, computer technology, robotic, and computer games. There are many faculties, but we can continue. We can bring the people from here, we can bring them on this place, and then we, we discuss this further. And uh, since, you know, a lot of galleries are also, you know, selling artwork, so there is actually money, there's value in these works. And when people have collected them, they want to make sure that the value continues. Uh, do you see also a role in, like, uh, commercial um, companies that actually take on this task of conserving the artworks instead of putting all the load on the galleries and on the artists, but actually some businesses that start to make money with conserving and, you know, kind of restorating the yeah, artworks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is what we need. But the problem is if you are a gallerist and people come to you and they have no experience with technology art and then they are afraid and then they ask and then and they buy, perhaps they buy, 20 years later, what I have now, the problem, everything has changed. Who is now paying for these uh, collectors that we transfer her art piece, what they have, in a new generation of technology today? And not everybody is open to, to do this. They expect that the artist or the we are doing this. And this was a good, um, a good uh, uh, point for Mr. Fletcher. 
I think if you sell artwork, uh, technology-based artwork today, you have to fill in in the contract a paragraph where it, this is written that they have to be take care about this uh, adaption for the future, but the artists who are still living, they have to give them the master files or the whatever, but the, the production in the end that they have the physical USB stick or the whatever, this is the problem what, ha what has to be declared in the contract. But NEO, we talk, we're talking now with NEO, there is a new generation what you, from technology companies yeah. perhaps they but, can... But, but this also only covers, um, covers um, films or video which is um, single screen or maybe three screens videos, but not all this interactive uh, works which are much more problematic because you need, uh, you, you have, don't have the computer systems anymore of 1995 or, or even, even earlier. So that, that is a big difficulty also the ZKM has, that, that they collect yeah. all the old devices and uh, so that they can play it on, on the old devices or you have to transfer it. And uh, that is a really a, a, a much bigger problem with, with all these interactive things than with, with just films, yeah, because just films film you can videos, digitalize yeah. and then you can put it on, on the new, um, up-to-date uh, status, but uh, with digital, you have to program new, new uh, with, with these interactive things, you have to program them new, and uh, this is much, much more difficult than, than just uh, film or, but, or video. Yeah, this is also a question of our generation, because not everything is available forever in our generation, where technology is so uh, um, so important. I think there is also to, we have also to change our mind that you buy a piece and this piece is perhaps relevant for 20 or the 30 years and then it's gone. But if people pay a lot of money for it, then they will not, uh, they will not agree that the piece will be gone after 20 years. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Anita, for your contribution. Um, and now I'm going to introduce a um, um, new section. Yeah, please. We are now at the second section of the symposium, which is uh, focusing on the um, new methods and formats. So uh, it's referring more directly to what also Anita was introducing, like to so new platform of distribution and collection of digital art content. So our first uh, speaker is Ashley Lee Wong, uh, who is a researcher and curator based in Hong Kong and London. And she's associate head of program of sedition. She's also co-founder of an international research collective called DOXA, and she completed her master in culture industry at Goldsmith University. As independent researcher and curator, she has been uh, presenting internationally, like in uh, institutions like uh, Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, the National Museum of Anthropology in Madrid, Metropolitan University of Applied Science, and Buff Center. Uh, please welcome uh, Ashley. Great. Hello. Thank you, Alessio and uh, Krista, for the invitation. It's really great to be here. Uh, can we just get the slides? Oh. Okay. So, as Alessio mentioned, I'm head of programs at Sedition, um, where I've worked for the past five years in London. Uh, I also recently started a PhD um, at the School of Creative Media at the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with Sedition, but for those who are not, I will briefly run through our model. I will then outline a few of our, uh, the challenges and opportunities of creating a new marketplace for digital art, and then open up to new imaginings of the future of the art market, particularly in the age of uh, artificial intelligence as a the theme of this year's uh, Ars Electronica. 
So Sedition is the leading online platform for artists to distribute their work as digital limited editions, videos and images that are displayed on TVs, tablets, and smartphones. Uh, you can display them using the browser or using our apps for iPhone, Android, and Apple TV. Uh, the company was founded by Harry Blaine, who's an art dealer um, who founded it in 2011. He is also founder of Haunch of Venison and Blaine Southern Galleries. Um, and from this background, from the very established blue chip gallery world, uh, we have relationships with some of the world's most renowned contemporary artists, including Tracy Emin, Jenny Holzer, Isaac Julian, Yoko Ono, Bill Viola, and so forth. At the beginning, we released a number of works by these artists to help build a profile for, the, for a new platform that presents a, a way of collecting screen-based artworks. So I'll just play a few, uh, uh, give you a preview of some of the artworks we have on the platform. Um, increasingly, it made more sense for us to work with a digital native artists rather than adapting physical artworks such as paintings or sculptures to the digital realm. Some of the artists that we work with, uh, some of the digital artists that we work with include Universal Everything, Field, Quayola, and Leah. We have contracts with all of our artists, and we offer a 50-50 revenue share, which is similar to that of a gallery. So over the past five years, we have grown an online audience of over 500,000 across our social channels and newsletter. About 10% of these are dedicated members who actively collect on our site. Uh, is a global audience with about 30% in the UK, 30% in the US, 30% in Europe, and the rest of the 10% is spread across the world. So the way it works, uh, purchased artworks cannot be downloaded, but they are held securely in your vault in your Sedition account. Works come with a certificate of authenticity that is signed by Sedition and the artist. When artworks are sold out, they can then be resold on the Sedition trade platform where collectors can bid any price for the artworks. Sedition is a closed marketplace where artworks can only be bought and resold on the platform. The first artwork to sell out was an artwork by Ryoji Ikeda. Uh, the work was offered at just uh, five pounds in addition of 300. Now the work is selling upwards from 50 pounds to 75 pounds. They are still small sums, but it shows how the value of the artworks can grow. So Sedition has experimented with a, a streaming subscription service called ArtStream, where users can subscribe for a monthly or annual basis. The stream consists of 12 curated artworks at any one time. Uh, each week a new artwork is added and one is removed. So Sedition has a curated platform where we launch artworks on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. We also have an open platform, which is open to artists to create a profile and submit works to sell. If you're an artist, you can go to seditionart.com submit and start submitting works. We have worked with a number of museum partners who have acquired sedition works into their permanent collections. We have also worked with a number of institutions who have commissioned new additions. In the past year, we have created physical gift cards for the artworks. These gift cards have a gift code on the back, which can be used to redeem for an artwork on our website. We have installed point of sale displays uh, to sell artworks from the museum gift shops, including at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, Museum Kunstpalast in Dusseldorf, uh, the Royal Academy in London, and the Broad Museum in Los Angeles. We have found, despite the artworks being digital, that people still enjoy having a physical object to gift. We have also experimented with a physical frame product, such as the Sedition Frame, which is a high-quality tablet frame which uses existing tablets uh, as a digital picture frame for displaying Sedition works using our apps. Uh, there, are, there have been many new art frame startups in recent years, uh, selling dedicated frames uh, for displaying artworks. However, they have struggled to gain market share, and some of the companies, such as Electric Objects, have been forced to close in the past year. On the other hand, uh, large electronic companies like Samsung are entering the market with designer TVs that can double as art frame devices. The hardware business is very difficult to get into, which is why Sedition has chosen to focus on the artists or content. 
and to use existing hardware in developing apps to enable people to play their artworks across their devices. For Sedition, our strength is our relationship with our artists. Having come from the gallery world, we have a deep understanding of the art world. We have conversations with nearly all the frame companies looking for artists, but some of them lack the expertise to access the art world. At times, it can be difficult for large companies like Samsung to approach artists directly. As a result, we are working with Samsung on, a, on their new designer TV called The Frame, uh, which has just launched globally. We have licensed a series of image-based artworks for their devices, which are available for sale in sub and subscription. It will be interesting to see how The Frame performs on the market, since Samsung have the capacity to test the market globally. So as an online platform without a permanent gallery space, we often partner to present exhibitions and pop-ups. Uh, we have produced a number of exhibitions with artists to showcase their digital editions on screens, but to also present their wider artistic practice, which may include sculpture, installation, or VR artworks. Artists today have to explore all the economies available to them. We see sedition as just one way to sell works in digital format to help artists earn a living and to complement their wider practice on top of commissions, residencies, performances, and festivals. This is a picture from uh, our solo exhibition with Field at the Hospital Club. Um, it features their VR sculptural artwork, Quasar. So this is a video uh, featuring uh, Matt Pike from Universal Everything, who explains how the economies of open and closed models of distribution can coexist, which is a comment about uh, putting your works on YouTube. The contemporary digital art world is really interesting in the sense that it's a, a new format that's, because of the nature of digital, the way it's so malleable and easily distributable, it's like how do you create something that is collectible, it is scarce, it is limited and it still has this uh, appeal. So I'm kind of torn between um, creating works that can be shared socially and have sort of 300,000 pet plays and creating works that can be enjoyed by one person and I, I'm really interested in that kind of um, balance between the two, how you can create this kind of sense of really intimate ownership at the same time as um, knowing that 300,000 people have watched something but you own a, a kind of a slice of that kind of moment in history. So Matt Pike, his uh, position is that you can, these economies or ways of uh, d distributing works can coexist. And he can put work online for free on Vimeo. At the same time, he can still create limited high value artworks that can create a sense of intimate ownership. Both of these approaches have their own value and systems for its appreciation. Over the years, we have identified several challenges. One challenge, obviously, is keeping up with technology. Now televisions are coming up in 4K resolution. We are starting to collect works in 4K, but some of the older works will not be able to upgrade to higher resolution due to, how, and due to the processes in which they are made. Currently, our platform only supports full HD, uh, though we often retain 4K versions of the artworks for future evolutions of the platform. A major challenge is also educating people about digital art and what they are buying, and how to display the works on different devices. It's a new way to collect art, and much of our time is spent explaining how sedition works and educating people about the artists and their work who may not be widely known in the gallery world. Another challenge is pricing and edition sizes and the valuing of digital artworks. Initially, we started with high edition sizes and low prices. Now we're working with smaller edition sizes and slightly higher prices to create a sense of scarcity and to also sell out the, addition, the additions for, for resale on the trade platform. We find people enjoy more exclusivity. The pricing becomes difficult with media artists when they would sell the same artwork in a gallery uh, for a higher price. Since we're working on a limited edition model, we would like the works on Sedition to be exclusive, even if they are modifications or derivatives of an original work. We are looking to also increase the value of works on Sedition to be equal to those selling in a gallery, but this is also part of our evolving model and the shifting value of digital art. The value of digital art is still very much emerging. 
where there are still very rarely any digital works for sale in art auctions, and very few artists represented by commercial galleries, and few artworks that are acquired by museum collections. But this is slowly changing as we gain expertise on how to ma maintain and preserve artworks, these artworks. We'll need new infrastructures and standards, as we were talking about earlier, for artwork maintenance and preservation for, for the works over time, and to raise the value and appreciation of media art through criti critical writing and education. You can see here the auction results from Phillips' first digital art auctions in 2013 and 14 in New York and London, which featured primarily physical artworks. Michael Staniak's piece sold for the most at 25,000 pounds, which is still relatively low compared to traditional forms of art. So some opportunities we have identified include artist representation and management. Many media artists that we work with are not represented by galleries, and as, as I mentioned before. However, we see a demand from these artists for support to help manage the distribution of their work on a professional level. There is potential for Sedition to represent artists and provide service to help them find commissions and licensing opportunities for their work and to help mediate with corporate and museum partners. Sedition could represent artists similar to a gallery or perhaps like uh, Steve's uh, agency, but without a permanent exhibition space, but perhaps more like an agency, um, which is more prevalent uh, in the music industry with art artist managers. So beyond the individual artwork sales on our platform, a major area of growth is licensing and corporate partnerships. We are often approached by hotels, hospitals, private clubs, and firms who may have large screens installed in their lobbies and outdoor spaces. Rather than displaying advertisements, they would rather license or commission new artworks for the screens. In some cities, 1% of property development budgets are required to go to towards public art. With more screens being installed in buildings, this is a potential for more digital public art commissions. We have an ongoing partnership with Edition Hotels, uh, with whom we've curated a collection of works for display in each of the hotel rooms in London, New York, Miami, and Sanya in China. They commissioned a new work by Matt Kalasha for the opening of their hotel in London. These licenses are negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the artwork selected and the duration of the display. We can offer the works on a monthly or annual or lifetime basis. Sedition helps to curate the artworks, mediate with the artists, and consult on the installation and maintenance of the artworks on display. So we are also looking at opportunities to evolve the Sedition model, which involves keeping abreast of the latest tech trends. We're looking at blockchain in terms of how it can evolve the model to allow peer-to-peer -peer transactions where people can ascribe and verify ownership of artworks on a universal ledger. This would allow Sedition to evolve to be an open marketplace rather than a closed one. We're also looking to support different forms of media artworks such as genitive or VR artworks and other possibilities of distributing physical digital artworks. The challenge is how do we sell VR artworks that can work across platforms? Some of you may already heard of the new platform Acute Art which will be an interesting development to watch. The issue with Sedition is that it limits artists to a particular format of videos and images. Same with VR or generative works. We'd have to choose one platform and expect artists to create works in the format to allow for consistent distribution. The issue with technology is that the format would change. And unlike books or music, art can take many forms. We don't intend to limit artists, but to present one model for screen-based works, similarly to photography or prints. This is an example of uh, Leah's artwork, which has just launched on Sedition this week. Um, it's a generative artwork, but we sell, what we sell is a video capture of the artwork. So we're, we are seeing media artworks entering the mainstream art market, primarily through post-internet artists, who tend to create saleable physical artworks. The director of Mark, Art Basel, Mark Spiegler, puts it nicely to describe how digital artists may define their own art market. In the early days, if you wanted to make art digitally, you had to almost become a programmer. And in a sense, the digital is everywhere in the art world right now. Where it gets really interesting, I think, is the work that is purely digital from beginning to end. 
and where almost anything is possible. If you look at the impact on the market, you know, it still takes a pretty pioneering spirit to be a collector of digital art. For the entire history of the art market, what was sold was a physical object, a sculpture, a painting, a drawing. And now you have works which exist only as bits and bytes. They exist as code. And that changes the game. There are other issues. What are you buying? And will my friends understand it? And is it really art? I don't see any sort of massive disruption coming on because of the advent of digital art. The question will be more, how much do they want to be in the art world as it exists today? And how much will they define their own sort of art world? One where authorship and ownership is less important than collaboration and production. So Spiegler suggests the ways in which artists may define their own art world that emphasizes collaboration and production. We are also seeing a generation where digital is shifting away from concepts of ownership over experiences. What implications would this have on how we envision the art market of the future? So currently I'm based in Hong Kong, which is a rapidly, has a rapidly developing art sector with new museums, including the M Plus Museum, which is due to open in the next year or so, is poised to become the Tate of Asia. It, uh, it has also recently um, been, has the Art Basel Hong Kong Fair, um, which was started off as the RHK Fair and was bought out by Art Basel. The city also suffers from many of the issues of global cities with extortionate property prices, which is a condition of what I'm calling the post-crisis creative economy. The cultural de development in Hong Kong is largely led by the private sector, but this development also provides us an opportunity to imagine what the cultural sector, museums, and art market could look like in the 21st century. So one of the more interesting new galleries that has opened in Hong Kong in recent years is Empty Gallery, which is essentially a black cube gallery that supports immersive and often sound-based media installations and performances. It also houses a publishing platform and recording studio that produces vinyl, vinyl records, artist books, and multiples. From this, can we start to imagine new models for galleries and organizations that better support the presentation, production, and distribution of media artworks? Can we also borrow new models from the tech sector, such as incubators, co-working spaces, or maker spaces? How can these models be reworked to be considered as an expanded notion of the art market? How would they best support artistic production and perhaps develop artists as businesses in which they are? Also, what are the opportunities for tech companies to, to support art production? There are many new residencies, including BuzzFeed's residency, Autodesk Pier 9, the ThoughtWorks Arts residency. Rather than supporting artists merely as a branding exercise, can companies play a role in supporting emerging artists, facilitating production and skills development, and providing access to technology, particularly in a time when there is less public funding for the arts. What are the potentials of collectively owned and managed platforms, which are truly peer-to-peer -peer without interference of third parties? These, are these models viable, and how would they work and be managed effectively to benefit artists fairly? Magnum Photos is one example of an artist cooperative whom we've worked with um, whom we have a partnership with this year to release a series of photographic editions in celebration of their 70th anniversary. This is an example of a hugely successful cooperative model, which has managed to survive and become a globally recognized and highly respected brand over the years for photography. We are at a festival where the theme is AI. What are the implications of AI on the art market? In one sense, we, also, we have generative artworks, which are a form of AI. You can also think of AI-curated online exhibitions. But we, can, we also have automate, can we also think about automating the sales of artworks and consider AI-driven galleries or marketplaces? This is an example of a company in China with a self-driving convenience store in which the purchase, stocking, and delivery of items are automated. Other implications of AI on the wider economy include considering the day in which machines take over our jobs. Perhaps the kinds of work that are not, perhaps the kind of work that we do not, we often, that are not often remunerated, such as care work or creative work, are the last jobs we would want to be automated. When we no longer have to work, we would have more time to be creative and truly imagine the world that we want to live in. 
Without jobs, we would require government subsidies in the form of a universal basic income. In a post-work society, are there possibilities to separate art creation from the market? These are the possible futures presented by AI, which may seem far into the future, but could be a hopeful goal to work towards. Lastly, a new project of mine is called Meta Objects, which is currently a digital studio to support the digital production for artists and the cultural sector to produce digital projects, including 3D printing, VR, web, and audiovisual works in a way that facilitates uh, the sharing of knowledge. It is an open-ended model that may evolve to be a curatorial research platform. It is also an attempt to experiment with organization, organizational and economic models that explore the production and distribution of digital works. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashley, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions? Question for you, Ashley. Is mm -hmm. this also all part of your PhD thesis, or what's the relationship between all the research and work you're doing and your PhD I research? I mean, I only start to delve very lightly on my PhD research, mm -hmm. which is largely starting from um, the critique of creative economy uh, in the UK and looking at the current state of the arts, uh, particularly as we see more graduates coming out living quite precariously, but also looking at developments in China and how their creative industries are developing. And then looking at, I guess, developments in Shenzhen as a kind of design center and how they approach kind of cultural development, which may open up to new ideas of what the future of art and culture, art market could be. Mm -hmm. I think you should talk to LSU. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, other parts of the PhD look at the ways in which artists also experiment with their own economies. So some artists I'm also working with is like Jeremy Bailey, who's you know, taking the startup model, but how can artists use that model as a way to kind of accelerate their own practices and to develop a, a sustainable practice? Okay, thanks so much. Now I'm going to introduce our next speaker. <clears throat> Um, Oren Moshe, uh, who um, I invite to the stage. I don't know. He's here. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Hello. So, uh, Oren Moshe is co founder of NEO, uh, he's an award winning product, uh, product and design expert with 18 years of experience in the world of technology, art, design, and digital uh, culture, where he has constantly driven innovation and at the intersection between this world. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm really excited uh, for the opportunity to um, uh, be speaking here today, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, maybe I need Yeah, you can hear me fine. Um, and the, the reason behind this uh, speak is to share with you some uh, insights and some um, ideas uh, that we've encounter encountered in our um, mission to try and solve this quite interesting and quite uh, challenging riddle. What does it mean to uh, collect and to distribute uh, new media art? Um, some of you might, may know this impressive artist called Davide Quayola. This is his uh, work in the Moscow Biennale. The video is uh, represented by Bitforms Gallery. And although these works, when we meet them as uh, audience or as collectors, we're immediately and intuitively uh, drawn to them. They seem very natural to us. They're moving, they're interacting. When you actually look behind the scene, and a lot of the speakers uh, before me today mentioned that, it's actually quite a complicated uh, riddle to sometimes even get one artwork to be presented at one remote location. So behind the scene, a curator would struggle to even find the work, then uh, contact the gallery, probably get a email link, later would probably ask for some contracts and uh, ability to share the link with other uh, curatorial committee members. 
Then, uh, after contracts are being transferred and maybe agreed upon, unique contracts for each and every entity, uh, the artist will probably be introduced as well, will render a copy, send it either through WeTransfer, Google Drive, or sometimes even hard drives that are traveling to the other side of the world. There, an uh, IT team or an AV team will be getting that file, trying to connect it, checking that it actually works, and sometimes they even go back and forth a few times to the artist in order to just get a render file that can be presented properly. And this is just for one work uh, in, in, in one event. Imagine what happens when the collector is then introduced or another entity, another institution now would like to uh, present this uh, work. So as you can see, uh, it's quite a complicated and quite, quite an unupdated model. And I think this brought us to, uh, to be very excited about trying to solve this riddle and uh, it, trying to um, um, introduce a very simple process uh, solving a very complex uh, problem. And what we um, introduce in you is a single dedicated end-to-end -end solution for managing, distribution, distributing, sorry, and, and displaying these uh, works. And when we say here new media artworks, we don't just mean uh, video art, we actually mean every type of um, rich uh, format uh, media. Um, meaning first of all, uh, synchronized screens and multi-channel display, sometimes in different resolutions, meaning uh, complex video walls with generative works running in real time. And actually uh, introducing uh, ability to help artists that are naturally drawn to the most complex and the most unique and the most interesting new technology tools. They never want to be limited when they create the works, but for some reason we still didn't find the solution in order to allow simple and seamless distribution and display of these works, not to mention collecting, of, collecting them. So when we look at this uh, medium, and we know that formats will only grow, and uh, some people before me mentioned also the need of preservation, we look at video art and multi-channel video art, but we also look at uh, augmented and virtual reality. We also look at uh, interactive and code-based mediums and er any type of digital created medium that will need to be, di dis be distributed and consumed uh, digitally. We, when we started this um, quite challenging project, we spent a lot of time interviewing the main stakeholders. We spoke to artists and galleries and collectors and curators and to academies, and it came down to three quite significant problems. First problem that was described is that the content is actually very hard to find, inaccessible. So we thought, what if uh, curators or collectors or anyone in this medium could, to, could access one big um, standardized uh, repository and very easily search and contact the content owners? Uh, another thing that we've uh, very fast identified is that there's a serious lack of uh, tailor-made uh, in intended tools to solve the complex workflows that we've seen uh, uh, before. What if we could have one simple dedicated solution that takes care of these complex work, uh, uh, workflows but in a very simple, simple and, and uh, seamless way, also underpinned by the standards of both legal, commercial, and preservation needs? And last but not least, within the art world, this medium is usually uh, uh, being uh, treated as a scarcity model, limited edition model. Some people before me also mentioned the importance of allowing and supporting new models. How can we solve the riddle of allowing that while growing with the needs of the market, with the needs of today's uh, culture and society? And I think the, this is a, a detailed uh, illustration or, or drawing, but it actually takes care of the main principles that we thought are crucial and needed in this, in this space. Uh, I think the first and most important thing for us is we did identify that this is a complex riddle, not easily solved, and we didn't want to simplify it. We actually wanted to invite all the community, all the different stakeholders, uh, to sit with us on some sort of a virtual round table and each contribute their own unique uh, approach, their own unique needs, their own unique uh, understanding of these medium standards. So you can see that the variety is, is, is quite big and quite unique. We actually reserve the space for curators, for gallery owners, and of course for artists to be able to drive this forward with us and create together one purpose-built collaborative ecosystem. This is taking care of both, as we said, all entities, rich formats. This is taking care of standards. 
so that not each uh, individual artist or gallery should have a, a, a full-time lawyer just to transact one file or one uh, collectible item. And this mainly means creating very specific, very professional um, and highly detailed tools that allow these people to collaborate together. And what are these tools? First and foremost, there's quite a, a, a strong need for a robust cloud storage and preservation solution. So the ability to upload massive files, to have all the metadata, all the additional documentation and files that are needed, instructions, to a sense where it's actually a collection management solution. So that's a very strong thing that can be used as a private tool. Second thing is taking care of all the rendering and display copies that are needed and allowing the standards for preservation and backup and storage for future proof. Second set of tools is quite a robust professional uh, audiovisual art player, one that can deal with multi formats, all the rich formats, one that can deal with one or multiple synchronized screens with different resolutions, one that can uh, um, be used on any kind of screen or projector and not limited to a certain manufacturer. And a very interesting and very important capability is the ability for both artists and curators to remote, remotely control and remotely curate from afar these screens in, in uh, different installations. And the last pillar, or the last main tool, which is actually also the heart of the platform, is quite a, um, uh, an innovative transfer and uh, commerce engine mechanism that allows each entity, each of these people in the ecosystem, to very easily uh, send files for different needs based on different uh, distribution and uh, commercial and copyright settings. So people can use this platform after they upload it in order to have all these complex transactions that we saw before with a very simple and very seamless uh, workflow. We put this thing about uh, two, three years ago in the hands of uh, many uh, professional entities in the art world. Currently we have close to a thousand entities working on the platform. Uh, they've stored and uploaded and transferred and displayed uh, near, near to 14,000 uh, artwork editions till date. And we are of course getting a lot of feedback and a lot of contribution to that think tank that I've mentioned before, the need to define and to allow certain modular elements and personalization within one standard approach. Uh, I think I've mentioned, uh, you've mentioned it in, in different uh, lectures today, there's a strong need to this collaboration, to bring the knowledge and the different angles and the different needs from the most represented and highly uh, respected artists and galleries up into even the last uh, students in the last academy all around the world that is dealing with more and more uh, digital formats. So what are these use cases that are being used on the platform? First is that ability to upload once uh, with all the metadata and all the media files that are attached to this kind of art project, which at the first phase can simply lead to a private tool that I can use and I can display and I can control in my own venue, if I'm an artist in the studio, if I'm a gallery in the local venue, but I also can take it to different exhibitions outside of the gallery space. Then there's the ability to transfer the works, as we've seen before, uh, based on sometimes published catalogs for private and public audiences. And at last, I can use this to send commercial rules such as preview, loan, and sell uh, elements to different entities in my ecosystem. So each of the entities on the ecosystem of NEO is able to use directly with the network that they already have and use NEO just as a tool to support their already existing needs. As we've seen before, there's a, a, a growing demand for complex formats, so the platform can control all these formats, synchronized screens, video walls, et cetera. And the main idea behind all of that is to allow artists the freedom to use these quite complex tools and be able to show them exactly as they intended in any type of complex environment, but uh, underpinned by a very simple and modular and easy to use and easy to control uh, system that can pr practic practically take this anywhere in terms of exposure, but still maintain this important uh, element of scarcity and control. So this is in, in, a, in a very short description what we're be, we've been doing. Uh, we have a venue downstairs where we are uh, empowering um, a, a very impressive uh, display by Rafik Nadal with collaboration of uh, Barco Residential. You're most welcome to come and meet us uh, downstairs in the basement, I think it's called. 
And we would love to just continue the discussion and explain more in details what we're up to and how we see this thing uh, growing to hopefully become one of the standards of this medium. Thank you. Thanks so much, Oren. And is there any question? Um, you did show a few things that uh, um, are not completely new in uh, the, the field of showing uh, um, video installations uh, or uh, GIF and so on. It seems, uh, do you, uh, what do you think it's the new contents, are the new contents that are, you know, uh, illuminating in your uh, project? show projects, uh, the place, for instance, uh, I remember 10, 12 years ago, there were already video artists uh, with um, a famous uh, telephone mark online, no? Uh, on, a, on a website that the, uh, the users of the phone was a Swedish uh, or a Finnish, I don't remember could see uh, a lot of uh, authors, well-known authors in the field of video art. <clears throat> the, the things going on in Times Square has a, has a long story. Um, what do you think is the more interesting, or more winning kind of format that you're proposing now? Are you asking about uh, the artistic formats or are you asking about the distribution formats? I wasn't sure uh, I, I understood the question. I, if you're talking about... Well, uh, the thing, yeah, you're right. Uh, the thing, I see the things, uh, may, you know, sort of going together in a way and uh, uh, probably the... Um, but let's talk about the formats. So, so at least the way we look at it, as we've uh, shown earlier, we don't want to limit the artist with the type of formats that they're using. So video art is just one element of the platform, but they can also use animated GIF or uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, interactive, code-based, generative. Whatever they work with in their studio, they, can, they have a place in the platform to upload, to back it up, and to transfer it to other entities. So in terms of formats, We've built an infrastructure that is ready for different modular uh, needs based on these technological uh, trends. Yeah, don't you have the impression that the formats in uh, um, uh, digital art are much more, much stronger in this moment uh, than uh, the usual changing from object to installation in the field of uh, visual arts? It's a question. So, so I'm not sure I understood. The, uh, the question, so. it's... Uh, if you don't think that uh, the changement of format uh, in uh, digital art is much um, stronger than uh, what happens in the visual arts uh, from, uh, let's say, an object uh, in an installation, you know, a wall, uh, a room, uh, and so on, uh, in, in visual arts. So the question is... So the difference think... between digital art and visual arts. What kind of differences uh, the works pose if they are in different formats? The difference between uh, uh, code-based art versus video art? Yep. Okay. So obviously video art is much more um, easily... Um, can be easily uh, be looked into the future as higher resolution, more frame per second, and different, more advanced codecs. And in uh, digital art or code-based art, you can look at the trends of the web as the uh, most important. Me web and mobile are actually the most important platforms in which you would expe expect mm -hmm. uh, growth and also some uh, needs for preservation because web is becoming a, a standard. You can see that if someone is, something is shown through a browser mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. all the new uh, release browser, it's probably meeting a web standard for generative or interactive, for example. You can go the same with the mobile operating systems and, and, and so on and so forth. So this becomes a standard, yeah. if, I, if I understand your question correctly. No, I agree with you, but uh, I have the impression that, uh, here I close, uh, that uh, the real um, reference 
to digital art, both uh, in video and in uh, interactive and so on. It's uh, with uh, uh, traditional visual arts, contemporary art uh, in the field of visual arts. That's uh, just my impression. Thanks so much. If there are other questions, there is still some time. Is there? Okay. Thanks. Um, so it's, it's quite a complicated ecosystem. So just wondering where you are seeing strongest adoption, where you're getting most traction, whether that's with artists or galleries or um, institutions. So usually artists are the fastest to adapt and also with relationship to uh, art fairs and events and, and call for entries. This is the fastest growing and the most needed uh, track, but also with the galleries who see this both as a distribution tool, but also as a way to uh, connect to their personal um, private networks of collectors and of collaborators. But I would say artists are the, the, grow, the most growing uh, sector to adapt. Why, why do you think that is? They're just um, they're, they're more familiar or comfortable with technology or what? I, I think, first of all, they're more familiar with these platforms. And as we saw before, they are actually using social networks and other tools for all of their ongoing daily activities, so it's more natural to them. Uh, usually, galleries would go through the artist uh, uh, recommendations, so if the artists feel comfortable with the ecosystem, with the tools, they would feel more, more strongly about it. But we do think it is an ecosystem, we do think working only with artists or only with galleries is not the right approach. Actually, the workflow that allows them all to go from uh, one step to the other together on the same platform is, I think, the key element. Thank you. I just would like to know again, what exactly is the business model compared to the one of Sedition in, in NEO? Or so is there a difference, or is it sort of similar? The, the, there's some similarities. I think Sedition were the first in the market, and we really uh, appreciate and, and admire the things that they were doing. Uh, Sedition is, as they said, is, is a bit more closed uh, garden. They're more of uh, like a, a big gallery. And um, I think our platform uh, is much more open in the sense that it invites even uh, entities like Sedition to be on it if, if they want to. It's, it's a more uh, collaborative uh, approach, more kind of an ecosystem. And with regards to the business models, there's two uh, business models in, uh, in, in the platform. One of them has to do with the uh, freemium model, where you can start with a free account and then upgrade as you need it professionally or, it, or it as it becomes more and more your tool for driving this business. So we can work with individual artists, but we also work with big libraries with thousands of works, which actually are using us as a substitute to their IT uh, platforms. So of course, the difference in, in needs and different in storage and in uh, activities is, is uh, taking it to a different level of, of uh, professional account, if you may. Just can compare it to Vimeo and other solution where you start with a minimum uh, account and then you grow. The second model is the model in which in some transactions and in some content um, um, loans and, and sales, we will take a commission based on that uh, account that you're using. If you're using the free account, the commission will be a bit higher. If you're using the paid account, the commission will be much lower. And what happens, I mean, this sounds a bit cynical, but what happens if your company goes bankrupt? So obviously we didn't start, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't start this process without thinking about this, <laughs> this problem. And as mentioned, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, medium and, and some companies started and, and uh, didn't make it to the, to the final line. Uh, first of all, we, we, we made sure that we are uh, working with uh, significant strategic partners that can guarantee that things, if things happen in a certain way, they will guarantee the process. And of course, we've put in place a process just like any other cloud uh, storage company in which if, God forbid, we either close or we uh, decide to move to a different uh, business or someone chooses to uh, get out of the platform, there's a, a very um, professional process on, on the time it takes to download the files from the platform to any other uh, a platform, even a local platform. There's even automatic procedures that we have in place because it's quite a robust system that we build uh, technologically. And what it actually means is, if you look at um, um, services like Google Drive or Dropbox, potentially if you're syncing uh, your folders to your local uh, devices, once they shut down, you have all the files on your server. If you're using standards and if you're using the same original files that were uploaded, then 
you just need to download them one more time and, and in a sense you're, you're, you're okay. We're not trying to replace anything. We're actually working on the current uh, business models that exist, so we're just another parallel approach to that, also with the, with the files. So it's a bit like Dropbox for professional artists. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can think about it. Again, this is just one element, one tool of the full set of tools that we're offering. One of it is, is to do with the cloud services. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. We are now having our uh, last speaker, um, Elizabeth Markevich. Well, uh, so Elizabeth is an art professional and founder of Icono, an international platform for visual art, uh, visual art broadcasting. Uh, since the 80s, she served numerous important roles in international art establishment like Artemis, Art Found, Schroeder Bank, Sotheby's. And in 98, uh, she found the she co-found the first online gallery, uh, iStrom.com. You ready? Thank you. Okay, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to shock you with uh, some uh, old masters because I'm sure you were all talking. I arrived late, unfortunately. I missed missed the first. Thing, um, the first uh, speech, and well, I'm really sorry because I was looking for it, but train and planes were all delayed. Um, this is how do we, uh, yeah. basically, I come from the art market because it's the subject, um, the traditional one. And I had, a, after 20 years or 25 years, I had a problem with the traditional art market, because I was dealing only with the elite and dealing only with the very rich collectors. And I was obsessed by a question which was, how can I share, in fact, my love with the arts with a larger audience? Um, all these thoughts came 11 years ago. So, um, as Alessio was saying, I, I also built the first platform um, for digital art and art digital because I think we should be careful in the terms also. In 1998, Harry Blaine was part of the launch uh, party um, at the time saying, I will do something like this digitally. And so he did it 10 years later or seven years later. Um, the whole concept of um, what you're seeing right now comes to the idea that when we are in the art world, we have this tendency to talk a little bit too much. Um, we explain the work of art, we want people to, um, to know about the work of art, while on the same time there is another experience with the arts, which is the emotional uh, moment that we have when we see it for the first time. And this is what I wanted to give and bring to people and in everybody's house, um, and using, in fact, the digital technology to do so. So I am not really an expert in what we could call today um, digital art, but what I'm trying to do is bring art to everybody's home in a very subtle way and um, becoming an only art and a visual experience. So Icono TV is, um, is a TV station um, that we're using every type of technology from an app on your iPhone to any TVs, um, and um, we're now also global, and the idea was, there was two parts. There is the All Masters, and the All Masters was how we're going to show All Masters without just doing a slideshow. And so we came up with the, the idea, let's come up with a story, which is a visual storytelling, working with art historians, working with artists, curators, whoever know about the work of art, and instead of having somebody as a voiceover or telling you, look at the upper right corner, zoom in, look at this character, and, and so on. We, in fact, are doing it with the filmmakers um, who try to do this with a camera. So there is a story, visual story, which you can guess when you see some of the films several times. We, um, that's one part, and the second part, which I didn't bring you here because I knew that we would have a lot of examples of video art um, already. Um, the second part is, of course, that we deal with over 500 
video artist. Um, and like on Sedition or Blink um, uh, and most of these platforms, we're basically telling them to, on one hand, share their um, content with the freemium because on the TV, you, it's, it's a kind of MTV of the arts where you can have, in fact, uh, from the antiquities to nowadays, a random, which looks random, but in fact we try to curate it, um, a random way of um, showing you the whole art history. And then there is the second part where, um, and it can be a business model, where we are offering, in fact, the on-demand, which becomes a kind of more kind of Spotify model, where the freemium would always be free. And if you don't like, for example, looking at Sisley and you would prefer to look at a video artist, we have on the on-demand section playlist by genre or by artist. And this is a 4.99 model per month, and it's a pure licensing business. So I have nothing to do with the traditional art market anymore in that respect. It's purely um, licensing. Um, and so when it's an on-demand, it's of course a B2C. And when it's uh, for hotels or public spaces, it becomes a B2B. So that's, that's the, the model of um, Icono TV, which is uh, to share art with, you know, as many people and to give them this um, desire slowly to then go to the museums and then have an experience. So I like to, when I do the presentation where I'm showing two parts, because I'm going to talk, I'm talking to you today about Icono TV, but I'm going to talk to you also about Icono Space, which is in fact um, the 3D answer to do what we do with the TV and to bring it um, in 3D. And so I need maybe your help here. And this is half a tool for professionals and half It's half a tool for professionals and half um, a tool, not a tool, but a platform for viewers. Today, when you build an exhibition, when you're, the, when you're a curator, you basically need, um, I'm going to stop it. Oop. Sorry, it's going a bit fast. Yeah, sorry. Just before it starts, I just want to tell you that uh, when you build up an exhibition as a curator, um, you have two or three ways to do it. You have the traditional way, which was to do the cardboard maquette, um, which is like a doll um, house, where you have your walls and you have your little works of art and you have to glue them on the wall. And it's basically very nice, but it's not very easy to share because even some museums have a very big maquette, so it, remains in the museum, so like that, you can't take it away. The second way, of course, is um, uh, the way to do it um, uh, digitally with your architect who's going to use AutoCAD or whatsoever. And these are complicated um, uh, softwares where you need to be a professional architect to use them, and you're dependent of the architect um, totally. Um, and um, the third way is to use um, free or almost free um, uh, tools like SketchUp to, to build it. And galleries are struggling with that because you still need one person who takes care of it, meaning the gallery owner can't really use it and, and so on. So the idea was to, um, to build a tool which would um, allow, in fact, anybody to build his own exhibition um, from doing the, the walls, implementing floor plans, and being able to do exactly in a few minutes your exhibition. What I personally love here, you're seeing that you can even build walls on your own, so it shows you how easy it is. It's really a, just your mouse, uh, you're using your mouse, and then it's a, what you saw before, it's a, a, a drag and drop system. Um, it is com it's completely for galleries. They have different um, uh, database uh, system like iBinders or whatever. Everything can be um, implemented in it. And um, you can now, since uh, a few days here, you're, you're building your doors 
and it's really you just put your size and you click on it, it makes your door. So this is, a, a, I think, a wonderful tool for not only the professionals, because of course with this they can share, it uh, becomes a PDF if you need just a, the, the 2D version of one wall, or you can, you can share it with, um, you know, you're creating in London, but your exhibition is going to be in Hong Kong. You can, um, of course, share it with your team in Hong Kong with all the, as you can see, there is all the details. And now we can implement some structure and, and so on. What is interesting for museums, it's like here you just have the, we did in fact completely reproduce here this maquette model, um, while for museums it could be interesting to reproduce in fact their actual um, interiors. Um, and imagine being, for example, we did lately the, the room where there is the night watch and the hikes museum, um, and you would have exactly the, the, the feeling you are in the hikes. And it becomes then, for the, the viewers, you can transform it as an iPad um, uh, tool, um, where the viewers can then visit an exhibition. What I personally like about this is also for museums, to do past exhibitions, because with the past exhibition, you know, for example, uh, I was lately in Moscow and we were talking about an exhibition, the first exhibition retrospective of Picasso in 1954 at the Pushkin. Of course, none of us have seen it. Um, we might have heard about it if we know the work of Picasso well enough. Um, why not revisiting it? So you can now implement the Pushkin rooms in this system um, and then, you know, how you, as you can see, you can um, visit it quite um, quickly. Now, I'll show you to finish that, of course, it's linked with VR, um, and um, which allows you to, yeah, I'll take off the sound because I think there is a kind of music if we don't need it. We did, in fact, a copy-paste of um, a young woman. <clears throat> we put her in the system, that's for the video. But what she sees in her glass is exactly what you are seeing in here in the background. So um, this is a completely, uh, this is a museum which doesn't exist, which has completely been done by an architect from our team who had fun. Um, and he uh, just, uh, here it's with uh, the work of, um, this graffiti artist, El Cid, who wanted to do a kind of ideal uh, exhibition. So this is what we are um, doing with either artists, because it's a way for them to show. They can do their own exhibition, which was the case here of El Cid, um, where they come up exactly with what they would like to do, and we can mix uh, things. Um, we are also working with VR artists. Um, as you know, VR artists are the one who create virtually and you need the glasses to see in fact what they are doing and so now we are working to to implement it in it and so like that you can not only see it with the glasses but you would be easy to see it also with the iPads and, and things like this. So yeah that's a, a quite a overview of what we can do as a 2D solution or 3D solution to bring art to everybody's home. That's it. Thank Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Elizabeth. Um, are there any, any questions from the public? Um, you are also uh, only working with old art, like older no, art No, no, I said we have over 500 video artists. And if you look at our stream, um, it's all mixed. You can see it. And if you go on the on-demand of our platform, you can choose the contemporary artist that you want. It's done by, by artists. For example, you can see the 17 videos by William Kentridge and or things like this that you can see on our on-demand. Mm -hmm. I just came here with only all masters because okay. to make a break. <laughs> okay. And is it also to include like into the interior design? Or? Yes. Okay. We're working a lot with real estates also.
Okay. It was in fact originally a tool done um, for the real estate and it's when I saw how easy it was to drag and drop in fact or to move things because when you use any of these tools I was mentioning from AutoCAD to SketchUp or whatever, you basically have to kill your project almost to if you want to just move your painting a little bit on the right or on the left. Here it's just your mouth doing it. It's really very intuitive and, and everything. So we can mix now both, yes, and in, we are starting to, to collaborate with Vitra, so like that we can implement their furniture in an environment like you saw now, if, you in, if we invent a, mu you know, a museum or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it is also interesting for architects because we can, um, I like to ask an architect projects which has never been done which are in their drawers or would remain in their drawers and it's a way to, to uh, tell them but have fun with us, let's do it in, you know, virtually and we can then do, you know, maybe there will be maybe a model where we rent it to you because you as a curator would like to use that interior, that space for a specific exhibition or whatever, so that's what we're trying to do. But they're funny models because with a museum, for example, they wanted to um, um, they still didn't, they just didn't, they wanted to find a sponsor for that, but uh, the idea was um, reproducing a real room, and so you're in it, you have the feeling you are in that museum's room, and then we could have, for example, 100 works from the collection, and you and me, we could uh, participate in a competition where we're doing the ideal exhibition with these 100 works. Either you just use one or you use the 100, it's your choice, you're the curator, you do whatever you want. And it was the idea that it could be a way to, to bring um, you know, the public to the museum um, and have fun by doing maybe a being, being the curator of a day. And why not, if you win the exhibition, we will do it in real in, in the museum. So everything we are doing, um, ex except, you know, there are some, um, we, we do not have, uh, we're not bringing here art. We're bringing an experience. Um, so we will never replace the real experience. And it's, it's a bit like, um, um, you know, you, you were talking before about this, um, the fears of, um, of um, galleries or artists when it comes to, you know, seeing works on the internet or things like this. I think it, it comes back also to this, this discussion which was in May in Cannes when they had this problem with Netflix, um, which is also an interesting case. Um, I think we should go for that. I think we should definitely go. I think it's the traditional business which is still a bit afraid of how to, to make the jump. We all know that the movie industry um, basically is um, working thanks to the sales of DVDs or Netflix today or whatsoever. So I think it's not, a, it's not relevant to be afraid. I think there is an experience for everything. As you were saying rightly, a real um, edition of a video will never um, be similar to what, for example, we are showing, even if it's the same. Um, it's a bit like um, one day I was telling somebody, it's a bit like if, if I'm very, very rich and I want to, for my birthday, um, invite Daniel Barenboim for a concert at home, um, for just my friends and myself, this is, you know, I'm going to spend, what, 500,000 for having Barenboim at home. Um, you could tell me it's stupid, he's playing tomorrow at the opera, um, it will cost you only 70. It's not the same experience um, than, than listening to a CD. So, there, every, everything is within a context and I think that um, in terms of uh, all the platforms existing today, they all have their purpose and they all have their, I don't think they are killing any, any other's platform or any other real experience. They are just different. Um, other questions? Um, no. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. So we reach the conclusion of the symposium. Um, so thanks everybody for for coming. Yeah.